Hi everybody and welcome to our module on liver disease. Before we talk about specific liver diseases, let me begin by talking about some of the tests we use clinically to assess the status of the liver. And the first two tests I'll talk about are measurement of the serum enzyme levels of AST and ALT. ALT stands for aspartate aminotransferase and ALT stands for alanine aminotransferase. These are enzymes found in the liver that transfer nitrogen groups between amino acids. In the case of AST, it's the amino acid aspartate, and in the case of ALT, it's the amino acid alanine. And in the biochemistry section, I talk about exactly what these enzymes do on a biochemical level. But for our purposes here, what you need to know is that you can measure the level of these enzymes in the plasma of patients, and the level of these enzymes increases when there's damage to the liver for any reason. What you further need to know is that AST is located in the mitochondria, and alcohol, which we'll talk about in a few slides, is a mitochondrial toxin. Therefore, in alcoholic hepatitis, which we'll talk about in a minute, you will see levels of AST that are much higher than the levels of ALT, and that's because the primary focus of the toxin is in the mitochondria where you find AST. ALT, on the other hand, is located in the cytoplasm, so in most types of hepatitis where there is cellular damage to the cytoplasm, you will see increases in ALT that are greater than the increase in AST. Both of these enzyme levels go up in any form of liver damage, but what I'm emphasizing here is which enzyme level will climb more. In alcoholic liver disease, the AST will climb more than the ALT. In most other forms of hepatitis, the ALT will climb more than the AST. The next blood test used to assess the status of the liver is measurement of the serum level of the enzyme alkaline phosphatase, which most people just call ALKFOS. This is an enzyme that comes from the liver. You can also find it in bones and also in the GI tract. Its precise function is actually not known, even though it's been used for a long, long time to assess the function of the liver. And the most important thing to know about this enzyme from the point of view of the liver is that there is increased synthesis of this enzyme with obstructed bile flow, which is called cholestasis. So anytime there's obstruction to bile flow, bile duct epithelial cells begin to synthesize more of this enzyme, and the level of this enzyme in the serum will rise, which you can detect with a blood sample. And an elevated ALKFOS level is a hallmark of cholestasis, which I talk about in a number of other modules. Importantly, however, you should be aware that the ALKFOS level can also rise in many non-liver conditions. ALKFOS can come from the placenta in pregnancy. The ALKFOS level can go up in thyroid disease. And then very importantly, the ALKFOS level can be elevated in bone disease. So if you suspect one of these other conditions, then you have to be cautious in determining whether or not the alkaline phosphatase level is due to obstruction of bile flow. If you detect an elevated level of alkaline phosphatase in the serum, but you're not sure whether it's coming from the liver and biliary tree or from the bones, you can sort this out by measuring the serum level of an enzyme called gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, which most people just call GGT. This enzyme is similar to alkaline phosphatase in that it rises in cholestasis and biliary obstruction, but it does not rise in bone disease. So as I said before, you can use it to determine the origin of an ALKFOS elevation. So if you have a rise in the alkaline phosphatase level plus a rise in the GGT, that tells you there is a hepatobiliary cause of the increase in ALKFOS. If you have an increased ALKFOS but a normal GGT, that tells you the ALKFOS is coming from bones. Another special feature of the GGT blood test that you should be aware of is that it becomes elevated after heavy alcohol consumption, so you can measure this level to determine whether patients have been drinking or not. There's a related enzyme called 5' nucleotidase. This is just like GGT. It is another enzyme that can be used to determine the source of an ALKFOS elevation. And then the final liver test that we won't talk much about in this module is measurement of the bilirubin level. In the bilirubin module, I talk about how you can measure total, direct, and indirect bilirubin levels and use these to determine what's going on inside the liver and the biliary tree. All those blood tests I just mentioned are often referred to as liver function tests, but they are actually liver dysfunction tests, meaning that they rise when the liver is dysfunctional. True liver function tests are tests that measure something the liver is supposed to produce normally. These are tests of synthetic function. So when the liver is truly failing, the albumin level will get low. That's because it's the liver's job to produce albumin. In addition, when the liver is truly failing, the PT and PTT tests will begin to rise. That's because the liver is failing in its job of producing coagulation factors. And if the liver is really failing, the glucose level will begin to fall, and that's because you need the liver to break down glycogen and perform gluconeogenesis to maintain a fasting glucose level. So abnormalities in these tests I've shown on the screen here indicate severe liver disease. They suggest that the liver is failing. The tests I showed you on the last few slides will become abnormal long before the liver begins to fail. They suggest that there's some degree of dysfunction that's beginning to build. 
The first liver disorder that we'll discuss is alcoholic liver disease. And the easiest way to keep straight all the different problems that alcohol can cause in the liver is to recognize that there are basically three pathologic processes that can occur as a result of liver consumption. The first is deposition of fat in the liver. That's called alcoholic fatty liver disease. The second is an acute hepatitis from drinking heavily. And then finally, chronic consumption of excessive alcohol, like among alcoholics, can lead to cirrhosis. Fatty liver disease occurs in alcoholism due to the accumulation of fatty acids in the liver. It's called fatty infiltration of the liver. If you look at this biopsy specimen from the liver here, you can see all these white spaces among the hepatocytes, and those white spaces represent fat deposition. In the biochemistry modules, I talk in detail about all the biochemical reasons why consumption of alcohol favors the synthesis of fatty acids, but for our purposes here, in talking about liver disease, all you need to know is that fatty acids accumulate in the liver among heavy drinkers. This is usually an asymptomatic condition. It may cause an enlarged liver on physical exam, especially in board questions. If they tell you the liver is enlarged in a heavy drinker, they are trying to tell you that there's fat deposition in that patient's liver. The liver function test may be abnormal, and as I mentioned earlier in this module, the AST usually increases to a greater degree than the ALT, and that's because alcohol is a mitochondrial toxin. If patients stop drinking, this is often reversible, and the fat will go away. And alcoholics who have fatty liver disease have a higher risk of developing cirrhosis from alcohol consumption. There's a tie-in with alcoholic liver disease and the anatomy of the liver. And to understand that, let me just briefly review the anatomy of a liver lobule. The liver is made up of a number of lobules, and each lobule has a similar structure. Every lobule has a structure called a portal triad, which supplies blood, which then percolates through the hepatocytes and then drains via a central vein to the hepatic vein. And the space between the portal triad and the central vein is divided up into three zones, zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3, and different pathologic processes affect the zones differently. In this slide, I've zoomed in on a portal triad just to show you that they receive blood from the portal vein, and they also receive arterial blood from one of the hepatic arteries. Blood then percolates, as I said before, through the hepatocytes to the central vein. This slide is a schematic of the zones in the liver lobule showing how blood flows through each lobule. Blood can enter through either the hepatic artery or the portal vein. It then moves through zone 1 and zone 2 and finally zone 3 before it exits via the hepatic vein. Zone 1 is called the periportal zone and zone 3 is called the central lobular zone. Zone 2 is called the mid zone. And the point here as relates to alcoholic liver disease is that fatty infiltration in alcoholic liver disease begins in zone 3. Zone 3 is affected first. This is also the first zone to be affected by fibrosis in alcoholic cirrhosis. And most liver pathologies affect zone 3 first. The only important liver pathology that affects another zone first is that viral hepatitis tends to infect zone 1 first. Most other liver diseases affect zone 3. There is another liver disorder that looks like alcoholic fatty liver disease but is not related to alcohol consumption, and that is appropriately called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is fatty infiltration of the liver that is not due to alcohol. Some patients have just a non-alcoholic fatty liver, or NAFL. Some other patients have what's called NASH for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This is where they have fat and inflammation in the liver. This is often an asymptomatic condition. It's often discovered when liver function tests are measured for some other reason, and it's noted that the ALT and AST are elevated. Usually in this case, the ALT is elevated more than the AST. Remember, only in alcoholism do you see the AST increase the most, and that's because alcohol is a mitochondrial toxin. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can progress to cirrhosis, and it is strongly associated with obesity. And the easy way to remember this is to just think of obese people having lots of excess fatty tissue, and in addition to depositing around their body, it deposits in the liver. This can improve with weight loss. Often the fatty liver disease goes away. A second problem that alcoholism can cause is acute hepatitis. This classically occurs after heavy binge drinking in someone who has a long history of heavy alcohol consumption. And in the biochemistry modules, I talk about how acid aldehyde is formed from heavy alcohol consumption and how acid aldehyde can lead to destruction of hepatocytes and acute hepatitis. So this will be a patient who goes out on a big binge of drinking and then presents with fever and jaundice and right upper quadrant pain and tenderness. They have acute hepatitis. And the reason they have this is because acetaldehyde has accumulated in their liver from heavy alcohol consumption. If you biopsy the liver in patients with alcoholic liver disease, there is a classic histopathology finding, and that is the presence of Mallory bodies. Mallory bodies are inclusions that can be seen in the cytoplasm of hepatocytes. They are caused by damage to the intermediate filaments of the cells. Recall that the cytoskeleton of cells 
has a number of elements, including the microtubules, but also thin filaments and intermediate filaments. And it is the intermediate filaments that are damaged in alcoholic liver disease that lead to the formation of Mallory bodies. If you look at this slide on the screen here, you can see this pink twisty structure that looks like rope inside the cytoplasm of a hepatocyte. That is a Mallory body, the classic finding in alcoholic liver disease. Our next liver disorder is the Bud Chiari syndrome. This occurs when there is thrombosis of the hepatic vein. When there's thrombosis of the hepatic vein, blood cannot drain from the liver and therefore the liver swells. So the symptoms of Bud Chiari syndrome will include abdominal pain from the swollen liver, hepatomegaly from the swollen and large liver, and then finally ascites. The reason you get ascites is because when blood can't drain from the liver, the blood backs up into the portal vein, pressure in the portal system gets high, and that pushes fluid out into the abdomen and results in ascites. On a biopsy specimen, you'll see problems in zone 3. Remember what I said before, zone 3 is where many liver disorders have problems. The reason you see problems in zone 3 in the Bud Chiari syndrome is because zone 3 is where blood is drained from each liver lobule, and it cannot drain because of a blood clot in the hepatic vein. So you can see congestion and necrosis and hemorrhage all in zone 3 of the liver. If we go back to this slide showing the anatomy of a liver lobule, blood drains through this central vein to the hepatic vein. If there's a blood clot in the hepatic vein, blood cannot drain, and as a result, the zone 3 will become congested and the hepatocytes will develop necrosis. So what causes the Bud Chiari syndrome? Well, it is commonly associated with myeloproliferative disorders, especially polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytosis, or chronic myelogenous leukemia. You can also see the Bud Chiari syndrome in hepatocellular carcinoma, and what occurs here is that the liver tumor compresses blood flow into the hepatic veins. Bud Chiari syndrome has also been associated with oral contraceptive use or pregnancy. And then finally, it's also associated with many hypercoagulable states, just like other thrombotic disorders. If you have right heart failure, you can develop cirrhosis of the liver. And the reason is because blood will back up from the right ventricle to the right atrium into the inferior vena cava, and then that blood will swell the liver. And if left untreated, that can result in cirrhosis, which is often called cardiac cirrhosis. This is a rare cause of liver failure that, as I said before, results from chronic liver edema. It characteristically makes the liver look like a nutmeg. This is a picture of a nutmeg on the screen here. The liver develops a mottled appearance. It's not smooth as it normally should be. And you can also see this in the Bud Chiari syndrome as well. This can occur from any cause where the liver is chronically swollen. Rye syndrome is a very rare cause of liver failure that you will almost never see in the modern era. It's a syndrome that consists of liver failure plus encephalopathy, and it classically occurs in children with certain types of viral infections who take aspirin for treatment of their infection. Classically, it occurred with chickenpox, which as you know is caused by varicella zoster or influenza B. And children who took aspirin for one of these viral infections sometimes went on to develop rapid severe liver failure. The reason is believed to be because there's some evidence that aspirin can inhibit beta oxidation and this can damage the mitochondria. And one of the reasons this is the suspected mechanism is because fatty changes are seen in the liver of children who have Rye syndrome. Eventually they progress to develop vomiting, coma, and death. And it's because of this association between aspirin and Rye syndrome that aspirin's not given to children any longer. Once we recognized this association and stopped giving aspirin to children in the 1960s and 70s, Rye syndrome largely disappeared. Now the only time children are given aspirin is in Kawasaki's disease, which is a rare vasculitis. It responds very well to aspirin, and it's such a dangerous condition that we give aspirin to children, even though there may be a risk of Rye syndrome. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a rare disorder that is inherited. It's inherited in an autosomal co-dominant fashion, and children born with this disorder have decreased or dysfunctional alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now what alpha-1 antitrypsin is supposed to do is balance naturally occurring proteases. In many tissues in our body, especially in the lungs, there are naturally occurring proteases which can destroy tissue, but then there are antiproteases like alpha-1 antitrypsin that balance those so that they don't destroy our own tissues. When children are born with an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, they get autodigestion of tissue in the lungs, which leads to emphysema. This will occur at an early age in someone who is a non-smoker in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And this is because there's an imbalance between neutrophil elastase, a naturally occurring protease that destroys elastin, and the elastase inhibitor, which is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So you don't have alpha-1 antitrypsin around to protect elastin. As a result, you get destruction of tissues in the lungs and you get emphysema. There is also a liver component of this disorder, which is less common than the lung involvement. Children with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can go on to develop cirrhosis. The mechanism here is different than the mechanism of the lung toxicity. What happens in the liver 
is that abnormal alpha-1 antitrypsin builds up in the endoplasmic reticulum of liver cells and it polymerizes. And this pathologic polymerization of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency leads to death of hepatocytes. And this is how some children who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can develop liver involvement as well. A very high yield feature to know about regarding the liver involvement of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is that alpha antitrypsin polymers, those pathologic polymers in the liver, stain purple with the PAS stain. PAS stands for periodic acid shift stain. If you look at this biopsy specimen on the screen here, you can see all these purple deposits amid the hepatocytes, and those purple deposits are pathologic polymers of alpha antitrypsin. Now, glycogen also stains purple with the PAS stain, and as you may know, there is glycogen accumulation in the liver in glycogen storage diseases. But you can differentiate glycogen storage diseases from alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency by treating the biopsy specimen with diastase. Diastase will break down or digest the glycogen, and the purple areas will go away on the slide. However, if the purple areas are due to alpha antitrypsin polymers, they will not go away. That's because alpha antitrypsin resists digestion by diastase. That's the term that is used, meaning that diastase will not break down the polymers as it will in glycogen storage diseases. A liver abscess is a walled off area of infection inside the liver. If you look at this CAT scan at the bottom right side of the screen here, you can see a liver abscess on the left side of the picture. In industrialized countries like the United States, this is almost always caused by bacteria. And there are two ways bacteria can get to the liver and form an abscess. The first way is via bacteremia. So if you have bacteria in your blood screen for any reason, those bacteria can travel to the liver and potentially form an abscess. The second way that bacteria can form an abscess is if they climb up through the biliary tree from the GI tract. This is called cholangitis. So if you have cholangitis of your biliary tree, gram-negative rods from the intestines can get into the liver and form an abscess. Klebsiella is a classic bacteria to cause an abscess in the liver by ascending from the intestines. There are two rare causes of liver abscesses that you should know, especially for step one. The first is a protozoa called entamoeba histolytica. I talk about this in the infectious disease modules, but if you consume cysts in contaminated water, you can develop dysentery, which is bloody diarrhea, and this protozoa likes to ascend in the biliary tree and then potentially cause an abscess. And then second is a helminth infection by echinococcus, Patients who get an echinococcus infection have fecal oral ingestion of eggs of the helminth, and they develop massive liver cysts. Echinococcus is famous for causing huge liver cysts. In the infectious disease section, I talk about viral hepatitis in detail. I'll just briefly review the topic here. There are five hepatitis viruses that infect the liver, hepatitis A, B, C, D, or E. They all cause a marked increase in the AST and ALT level in the serum. A normal AST or ALT level is about 50. In viral hepatitis, these levels can get over 1,000 or more than 25 times normal. There are a small number of disorders that do this. So when you see liver function tests in the 1,000, you know it's only one of a couple of things, and one of those things is viral hepatitis. Patients with acute viral hepatitis can develop hyperbilirubinemia and jaundice. If the infection is severe, you can see abnormal synthetic function in the liver, things like hypoglycemia and abnormal coagulation tests and low albumin and you diagnose viral hepatitis by viral antibody tests. And again, I discuss all this in detail in the ID section. Autoimmune hepatitis is autoimmune inflammation of the liver, just like the name suggests. It's more common among women, and this is true of most autoimmune disorders, and it classically occurs in the 40s and 50s. There are a range of symptoms. Sometimes the disorder is asymptomatic, and it's picked up when AST and ALT levels are measured for another reason. It can cause acute liver disease, and rarely it can progress to cirrhosis. You can make a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis with antibody testing. Antinuclear antibodies, or ANAs, are the most common antibody abnormality. As you may know, these antibodies are abnormal in lupus and many other disorders, so they are sensitive but not specific for autoimmune hepatitis. The more specific autoantibody for autoimmune hepatitis is called anti-smooth muscle antibodies. And you can treat autoimmune hepatitis with steroids and other immunosuppressants. Now let's talk about a Tylenol overdose. Tylenol, you may know, is a painkiller. It's sold over the counter, which means you don't need a doctor's prescription. So it is frequently taken in excess, either by accident or as a suicide attempt. Tylenol goes by several different names. It can be called acetaminophen. In many countries in the world, it's called paracetamol. And then it's often abbreviated APAP in doctor's notes. And APAP stands for N-acetylparaaminophenol. But whatever it's called, the maximum recommended dose is 4 grams over 24 hours. And if you take too much, you can develop acute liver failure from hepatic necrosis. 
And just like I said before with viral hepatitis, there's only a small number of disorders that cause the AST and ALT level to climb very high into the thousands. Viral hepatitis is one of them, and another one is a Tylenol overdose. The most important thing to know about Tylenol overdose for step one of the boards is how to treat the condition, and that's because there's some important biochemistry involved. So first of all, when treating patients with Tylenol overdose, activated charcoal is often given to prevent absorption of Tylenol from the GI tract. But beyond this, the mainstay of treatment is a substance called N-acetylcysteine. If you look at the bottom left side of the screen, this is the chemical structure of N-acetylcysteine. It's metabolized in the body into cysteine, and cysteine is used to synthesize glutathione. You can see that there's a cysteine molecule in the middle of a molecule of glutathione. So in other words, when you administer N-acetylcysteine to a patient with Tylenol overdose, their liver can use this to replenish glutathione. And as we'll see in a minute, Glutathione helps the liver prevent damage from excess levels of Tylenol. N-acetylcysteine is usually given orally to patients who have overdosed on Tylenol. There are three metabolites of acetaminophen, but the one that's toxic to the liver is called NAPQI, which stands for N-acetyl-P-benzoquinone amine. If you look at the drawing on the screen here, this is a molecule of acetaminophen. It can be metabolized into three structures but one of them is NAPQI, and this is what is toxic to the liver and causes liver damage. But NAPQI can also be metabolized by glutathione into a non-toxic structure. Therefore, if the patient has enough glutathione around, the liver is protected from damage by NAPQI, and that's why N-acetylcysteine is the therapy of choice for Tylenol overdose. Our last liver disorder for this module is called shock liver. It's also called ischemic hepatitis. And this is diffuse liver injury from hypoperfusion. It's often seen in patients who are critically ill in the ICU who have shock from any cause. They have hypoperfusion of all the tissues in their body, including the liver tissue. Shock liver results in marked elevation of the AST and ALT into the thousands. It's another one of those causes of a marked elevation of liver function tests. It's usually a self-limited condition. And the pathology here, again, involves zone 3. There is often zone 3 necrosis seen near the central vein in patients who have shock liver. And that concludes our module on liver diseases.